Good morning. I thought I was going to be a little late this morning because we were still on the road just a second ago, coming back from our Thursday uh, uh, shopping. So I'm still a little bit out of it. But anyway, I'm continuing talking about the Hermetic Rose Cross uh, diagram, which uh, Frida Harris used a simplified version of it uh, for the back of the Thoth Tarot. And we're discussing uh, the elements on the, uh, the more heroic uh, Hermetic Rose Cross. And if you're not familiar with that image, uh, just look one little uh, item down on my page and I've uh, I've posted uh, clear color pictures of what we're talking about this morning. <clears throat> and uh, I believe uh, we're talking about uh, the white square that is immediately below the the arms there. We talked about spirit yes, uh, yesterday, but in the more heroic diagram, there's a hexagram. Uh, like a Star of David, uh, surrounded by, uh, with the sun in the center and surrounded by the, the uh, six other planets of the ancients. The white square, or it, I call it the macrocosmic hexagram. The white square directly under the great rose contains a hexagram displaying the sun surrounded by the other six planets of the ancients. Placing this symbol of the macrocosm in the midst of the four pentagrams of the microcosm echoes on a higher octave the symbolic message of the marriage of the human and the divine. Uh, that was first told by the small rose and cross. For those of you who are familiar with the lesser uh, ritual of the pentagram, will recall the words, For about me flames the pentagram, and in the column shines the six-rayed star. Now, we're going to talk about the alchemical symbols that... Uh, the three alchemical symbols of salt, sulfur, and mercury are found in these lobes, these triple lobes uh, at the top and the, at the extremities of the arms. So there's four sets of alchemical uh, uh, symbols, and they're sort of shuffled in order. The alchemical symbols. Our examination of the Hermetic Rose Cross would be incomplete if we didn't examine the symbols of the three alchemical elements of sulfur, mercury, and salt, whose glyphs are found on the triple lobes at the end of each arm of the Great Cross. Not to be, not to be confused with the natural elements, fire, water, air, earth, and spirit, the three alchemical elements represent universal qualities or principles that interact with and are profoundly dependent upon each other. Crowley tells us that, quote, sulfur is activity, energy, and desire. Mercury is fluidity, intelligence, and the power of transmission. Salt is the vehicle of these two forms of energy, but itself possesses qualities which react upon them. And I would add, salt helps fix the, the alchemical elements. Notice that the symbols for these three alchemical principles occupy different lobes on each arm of the cross. Mercury is placed in the central lobe of the top and bottom arm, indicating dominance in air, 
swords, uh, in air, swords, and earth, discs. The symbol of salt dominates on the right arm, water cups, and the symbol of sulfur dominates on the left arm, fire wands. The secondary lobes of each arm are occupied with symbols of the not-so-dominant alchemical principles arranged in a logical and balanced manner. This is very important because when these three principles are combined and balanced, they create the alchemical substance known as vitriol, the universal solvent. Vitriol will soon become very important to us as we study the inner me mechanics of tarot. It's the initials of the alchemical motto, Visita Intoria Terra Rectificando Invenes Occultum Lapidum. Visit the interior parts of the earth by rectification, thou shalt find the hidden stone. In his discussion of the trumps, Crowley goes so far as to identify three cards with the alchemical elements. The magus is mercury, the empress is salt, and the emperor is sulfur. Other trumps also have alchemical significance. The art card is identified with the al uh, with uh, vitriol and the lovers. Hermit, death, and the devil all have vital roles to play in the alchemy of tarot. There's also one more extremely important alchemical symbol we will see often when we examine the trumps. It is called the Orphic Egg. This egg represents the essence of all life that comes under the formula of male and female. But we'll get to that later. Three gunas. That's a Hindu term. Crowley's reference to the rajas of Hindu philosophy necessitates at this point a brief discussion of the gunas. The concept of the three alchemical elements is almost identical to that of the three gunas of Hindu cosmology. The three gunas are rajas, tatvas, and tamas. Corresponding, corresponding uncannily to sulfur, mercury, and salt. Quote from Crowley, all the qualities that can be predicted of anything may be ascribed to one or more of these gunas. Thomas is darkness, inertia, sloth, ignorance, death, and the like. Rajas is energy, excitement, fire, brilliance, restlessness. Sattvas is calm, intelligence lucidity and balance." Unquote. These qualities are universally present and at work in all manifestation, manifested energy, including matter and you and me. They're in constant conflict, and at any given moment, one of them gains temporary dominance. Cosmic balance, however, dictates that no one principle can remain on top for very long before another usurps its position to enjoy its moment in the sun. The mechanics of this eternal three-way conflict is the driving force that turns the great wheel of the ever-changing universe. It is illustrated beautifully in the Thoth Tarot as Atu, or Trump, number 10, fortune, where Rajas, sulfur, is represented as the figure of the Sphinx, 
Tadvas, Mercury, by Hermanubis, and Tamas, Salt, by the figure of Typhon. And more about this when we discuss the card, Fortune. Now, uh, if you'll look to uh, the, the, one of the illustrations that I posted today, you'll see a real close-up of the center rows uh, of, three, uh, of three petals. And it's a close-up of the tiny uh, microcosmic uh, little tiny rose cross of, of uh, being that we see at the very center of the, the giant rose cross uh, image. And you'll see there's four little green leaves or barbs sticking out. We, we discussed it a little yesterday. I'm going to talk a little more about that right now. Uh, because around the Great Cross are also barbs or rays. Uh, actually, there, there are nine of them. Oh, excuse me, there's uh, uh, 12 of them. Uh, three for, for each corner. So the barbed rose leaves, radiating like glories from behind the great cross are 12 barbed rose leaves, four large leaves, each flanked with two small leaves. The four large leaves contain the letters I-N-R-I. And the astrological symbols for Virgo, Scorpio, Saul, and Virgo, respectively. Three of the smaller leaves contain the letters LVX, and three contain the letters IAO. The remaining two smaller leaves contain an additional letter I and a small Calvary cross uh, that looks like a small uh, lowercase t. To be perfectly frank, I've never learned a satisfactory explanation for the presence or the positioning of these two seemingly superfluous figures. Everything else is very explainable. The letters INRI are placed on the large leaves in the following order. I, the upper left, N, upper right, R, lower left, I, lower right. The letters IAO and an extra I are placed on the smaller leaves to the right of the large leaves in the same order. order. The letters LVX and the small Calvary cross are placed on the small leaves to the left of the large leaves in the same order. Because the Hermetic Rose Cross is a personal lamin of Adeptus Minor Initiates of the Golden Dawn, and because the letters INRI, LVX, and IAO play a key formulaic role in the mysteries of that degree, it's very appropriate that they appear on the device itself. INRI can be, mean many things, including the venerable alchemical axiom igne, igni, natura, renovatur, integra. All of nature is restored by fire. And the powerful spell that I often use to repel obnoxious telemarketers, telemarketers which is the initials of I, I'm not really interested. <laughs> Christian tradition, however, informs us that at Christ's crucifixion, Pontius Pilate ordered that a sign be posted at the head of the cross declaring in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, Jesu, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The real sign must have been pretty large to accommodate these three sets of messages, but future artists 
would be satisfied to display only the four letters I-N-R-I, the, the initials of the Latin words Jesu Nazarenus Rex Eudorum, painted on a wood board nailed at an angle above the head of a tortured and bleeding Jesus. For at least 1,400 years, the placard displaying the Latin letters I-N-R-I has been an indispensable accessory to every well-dressed crucifix. Not being satisfied with the officially sanctioned explanation of these letters that appear on holy images and souvenirs, Christian mystics and others toyed with the heretical idea that there just might be something else, something esoteric, some esoteric meanings to the uh, images of popular religious symbolism. Risking the stake and, and these spiritual outlaws proceeded to analyze INRI in such a way that it eventually said something other than Jesus from Nazareth, King of the Jews. That something else was a magical formula and the signs of that formula that express their highest understanding of the cosmic secrets of life, death, and resurrection. Briefly, here's what they did. They first took the letter, Latin letters, I-N-R-I, and translated them into Hebrew, Yod, Nun, Resh, Yod, reading from right, left to right. Then they meditated upon the astrological meanings of these Hebrew letters and discovered that they tell in their own astrological way the familiar Egyptian solar myth of Isis, Yod, Virgo, who mourns because of an, an evil relative, Apophis, Nun, Scorpio, has killed her husband, Osiris, Resh, Saul. Isis eventually raises Osiris from the dead, and the whole cycle starts again every morning and every spring. This is how INRI becomes IAO, which just happens to be the name of the supreme god of the Gnostics, who embodies the magical formula of life, death, and rebirth. Properly understood, the formula of INRI slash IAO explains the mystery of the annual revolution of the Earth around the Sun and its diurnal rotation upon its own axis. That is the highest mystery our Osirian Age ancestors could understand. It also is the secret uh, it is the secret mystery knowledge of all agricultural civilizations in the age of Osiris. Not bad for seven letters, three of which are eyes. <laughs> By tradition, Isis, Apophis, and Osiris are pictured making certain gestures or signs. The sign of the morning of Isis, Isis holds her arm suggestive of the letter L. And I'll, I won't be doing this sitting down, sort of like that. The sign of Apophis and Typhon thrusts his arms above his head at 90 degree angles, suggesting of the letter V. Those of you familiar with uh, classic tarot images of the uh, old Last Judgment card will recognize that the characters rising out of their tombs are making these signs. In the sign of Osiris slain, he holds his arms out to his side as if he was crucified. In the sign of Osiris risen, he crosses his arms over his chest, forming an X on his body. T 
Taken together, these are the signs of LVX, the Latin word for light. Here's how the key word INRI is analyzed in a formal ceremony. INRI, INRI, Yod Nun Resh Yod. Virgo, Isis, Mighty Mother, Scorpio, Apophis, Destroyer, Saul, Osiris, Slain and Risen, Isis, Apophis, Osiris, Eao. The sign of Osiris slain. The sign of the morning of Isis. The sign of Apophis and Typhon. The sign of Osiris risen. L V X looks the light of the cross. Magical tradition informs us that on the material plane and in normal waking consciousness, symbols are symbols and living things are living things. On the magical plane and in visionary consciousness, symbols are living things and living things are symbols. In other words, if I have a vision of a lion or a monkey, those images are merely symbols of something far deeper and abstract in my psyche that I need to confront. Conversely, symbols in visions are actual, actually living things in that plane. Let's say I'm faced in a vision by a terrible fire demon, a symbol of something I need to confront. I need only protect myself with a symbol, perhaps the banishing pentagram of fire, a symbol to me of the mastery of spirit uh, over the elements. But a living thing to a, de uh, to a demon who is forced by all the laws of its own existence to submit and obey. So in other words, the symbol, the geometric form, the pentagram to the demon is a living thing. I only bring up this tidbit of magical lore to impress upon you the immeasurable symbolic power stored in the Hermetic Rose Cross. Viewed on the magical plane, the cross is teeming with magnificent life and energy. The adepts of the Golden Dawn who wear it as their personal lamin are possessed with a most powerful magical tool indeed. Now, before we look at the cards themselves, let's learn just a little about the Tree of Life. So, Chapter 9 uh, of the section, Little Bits of Things You Should Know Before You uh, Begin to Understand Aleister Crowley's Thotero, uh, is titled Secrets of the Tree of Life. And that's where we'll pick it up tomorrow, Friday. So, <laughs> it's been quite a morning here at the Duquette House, and uh, in just a few moments, we're going off to the third and last store we need to visit this week, and I'll be back with you tomorrow. Continue to be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. 